of course, is the Italian hall as it looked in 1913. And a moment ago on the screen was what it looks like today. And in fact, I was out there earlier today at the site. I, whenever I'm in town, I always stop by and pay my respects, to make sure it's still there, see what new signage has gone up and so on. And um, the Italian hall, though, um, it's, it's, there's a controversy about why they took it down. And you know we can't uh, go back and undo that. Uh, but um, so you know we, we have what we have. But this is the Italian Hall as it looked in 1913. Um, top floor is the Meeting Hall. Bottom floor is the Greater Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, the A&P store. When I was young, I used to actually shop at an A&P store. And you might remember they had those coffee grinders at the checkout. The store smelled really, really well if you liked coffee. Um, I guess it would be, no, OK. And then on the left is Viro's Saloon. And if you're from this area, you know that Viro family is still around. Um, there was a Viro who was an attorney for many, many years. I actually interviewed him as I was doing research on the Italian Hall. And his grandfather was behind the bar on the night of the Italian Hall disaster. Um, so when you look at this building here, A&P Store Virus Saloon, and on the far left is the arch that they saved, which is out of the site. If you were to go into the hall um, to go upstairs, you go through those doors, up a steep flight of stairs, and then there's a meeting hall on top. And we'll get to that in a second. But what gets us to that point is the strike. And without the strike, I don't think the Italian Hall disaster possibly could have happened. So you have to understand why the strike took place. And of course, this is the copper country. There were thousands of miners up here working in the copper mines. And I know that that's you know, obvious, but uh, working conditions back then were very, very difficult. And it's hard to imagine nowadays in an age of OSHA and workmen's comm and safety inspectors and um, you know, safety equipment and computers and lasers and so on, that there was a time when men would actually go underground a mile and pry rock off the ceiling over their own heads and, and get paid by how much rock they broke loose and how much was pushed out on tram cars later. Um, the man on the left is using a pneumatic drill. The man on the right, of course, is prying with a bar. And there were... <clears throat> Thousands of men working in the mines, many of the immigrants who came to America specifically because you could get a job in this area with no skills and no English language skills. And in fact, there was a period of time when unemployment in this region was literally 0%. That is, any able-bodied man who wanted a job could get a job. If you weren't working, it's because you didn't want to work. So that's 1913, the working conditions, but there's thousands and thousands of men up here. And not all of them are terribly happy about it because the working conditions are so difficult. I'm wondering if this might help me turn this off. There we go. Getting a little feedback. So this man is a trammer, and I'd like to point him out as being the, the uh, prototypical worker in the mine because he's working uh, by all day long pushing a small train car, tram car, full of rocks down and he dumps them out and goes back and he fills it back up again and moves it and dumps it for 10 hours straight and he's going to make about three bucks a day. Uh, the man here probably doesn't speak English. This is the entry level job in the mine. So if you've got a job in the mine, speak no English, have no skills, congratulations, you get to push these tram cars all day long. Um, one of the fascinating aspects of the strike that came out, there were several investigations into the strike afterwards. And uh, convicts actually sent some investigators up here, and they did some questioning, and they created thousands of pages of testimony. A typical Congress, they did nothing with it. They created this gigantic thousand-page report, and then filed it and moved on to other more important things. And one of the things they discovered about the trammers was that they were paid by the pound, how many pounds of rock they moved a day. And yet, not a single mine in the QAnon had a scale on its premises. So your boss would look at your tram car and say, it looks about 500 pounds. And he'd make a note, you made 500 pounds that, that trip. And then he'd write down each load you did that day. And why that's important is, if you were a tram and you spoke no English, you just got to America, you needed a job, and your boss is eyeballing how much weight you pushed that day, if he likes you, you push more rock. If he doesn't like you, he's going to say you push less rock. And of course, that's subjective. It's whatever he says you push. So there's a lot of other things in the mines. It's not just the difficult work. It's the fact that there's this possible problem between you and your boss as to how much rock you're pushing. But it's also extremely dangerous work. On average, one man died in the mines per week 
every single week, week in, week out, in 1910, 1911, 1912. If you read the Daily Mining Gazette, it was a regular feature of the papers, which would say another Finlander died in the mines yesterday. Another Irishman died in the mines yesterday. It might not even say how he died, it might not give his name. Um, and you almost get the impression that, that someone dying in the mines is, is just another trivial fact being reported by the local newspapers. So in those conditions, difficult work, low pay, dangerous conditions, the Western Federation of Miners came into town and, and started unionizing efforts. And they had tried unionizing earlier, like 1906, 1908, but hadn't gotten traction. And to get a union, uh, to get a strike to be effective, you have to get enough people to join the strike so that when you call it, you can shut the place down. So Western Federation of Miners comes to town, 